stop by the welcome table in the, in the lobby because there's a gift for you as well as information about our church. Um, Wednesday night, if you would like to be with us, make reservations by calling the reservation line that's listed in your bulletin. I'm happy to say that the empty bowls benefit that's in your bulletin, we have sold out. Um, if you would like to make a contribution, that's a fundraiser for, uh, for, for the hunger, to end hunger. If you would like to make a donation, you are still able to do so, and I think you'll be able to get one of the bowls. But uh, we can't seat anymore. Uh, we're at the max for that. That is great. Please take note of all the upcoming events uh, for the month of February. They're listed in your bulletin as well. I want to make another announcement. If you were here Wednesday night, you already heard this, but uh, this is great news, so we want to hear it again. I am so honored and excited to be able to announce that beginning March the 1st, we're going to have a new addition on our pastoral staff. Missy Belote has completed the, the uh, local pastor's licensing school, and she's going to be appointed as a part-time associate pastor. Her responsibility is going to be with our evangelism and discipling programs. She is such a gifted communicator and has a passion for, for helping people come to know Jesus and grow in their faith. And we're just thrilled that she's going to be joining us. Would you all welcome her to our staff? Thank you. Yes. I know this is on Facebook Live, but Brad, I've got to say it. It probably didn't hurt that we have a family connection with the Episcopal office, but we're so glad that Bishop Taylor appointed, uh, appointed Missy to be here. Now let's... Uh, prepare our hearts and minds for uh, this hour of worship.
Let's worship the Lord together as we stand and sing our opening hymn, number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Please join me now as we read responsibly Psalm 37. Do not be angry because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good so that you will dwell in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord who will give us Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in God, who will act bringing forth your vindication as the light and your right as the noonday. Be still and wait patiently before the Lord. Do not be angry because of those who prosper in their ways. God knows who is evil Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not be angry. It leads only to evil. The wicked shall be cut off, and those who wait for the Lord shall possess the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look at their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall possess the land, and the light.
this time we invite the children to come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Here come a couple more. Have a seat, Miss Rachel. How are you? Hi, Lucy. Hi, Stella. Good morning, girls. Hey, Cahill. How are you guys this morning? Good morning. Um, so I bet you all know the song, If You're Happy. Yes. You think you know that song? No. Do you think everybody out here knows that song? Let's everybody sing just the first little part. Are you ready? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Good job. So I kind of wonder how it would go if um, that were sung by a bunch of birds. Do you think it might go, if you're happy and you know it, flap your wings? No. Maybe like that? No? Maybe not. Um, what about, it's a tough crowd today. What about um, if it were sung by a puppy? Do you think it might go, if you're happy and you know it, wag your tail? No. Swish, swish. If you're happy and you know it, wag your tail? Swish, swish. Maybe? No? Still no. Okay. Um, well, I heard a story about a little puppy. I love stories. I heard a story about a little puppy who noticed that whenever he was happy, his tail wagged. So he thought he had found the secret to happiness. One day, he shared the secret of happiness with an older dog. He said, I have learned that the best thing for a dog is happiness and that happiness is in my tail. So I'm going to chase my tail, and when I catch it, I shall have happiness. The old dog replied, I too believe that happiness is a marvelous thing for a dog and that happiness is in my tail. But I've noticed that when I chase it, my tail keeps running away from me. But when I go about my business, it follows me wherever I go. So the Bible has a lot to say about being happy. It doesn't say, happy are they who have a lot of money. Or, happy are they who live in big houses and drive fancy cars. It doesn't even say, happy are they who only have good things happen to them. One day, Jesus went to the side of a mountain. He sat down and he gathered all his disciples, remember his 12 best friends, around him. And he began to teach them about happiness. So even though these next words aren't exactly what Jesus said about happiness, I think they might help us to understand what he said. So Jesus said, be happy when you are poor in spirit, because then you will find that your riches are in heaven. Be happy with what you have, because then you will find that your heavenly Father provides everything that you need. Be happy when you help others get along peacefully with one another, because it is then that you will know the peace that comes from being a part of the family of God. So, happiness is not a feeling that is brought about by things that happen to us every day. It's an attitude that we have because of what we have in our heart. So many of us are like that little puppy chasing its tail, trying to find true happiness that it's always just out of our reach. What we need to do is learn that if we will just go about our business and trust in the Lord, happiness will follow us wherever we go. Let's pray. Dear Father, help us to have the happiness that you want for us. Happiness that comes not from what happens to us, but what, from, but what happens inside of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May go to God the Father.
God has been most generous to us. Now is our opportunity to return our tithes and offerings to him as the ushers come forward. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all the blessings you have poured into our lives, and we return a portion of the back unto you that they may in turn become blessings to others through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Scripture today is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Let's continue to center our hearts in the Lord as we stand and sing together hymn number 420, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
to be seated. <clears throat> Will you join with me in prayer? Father, in these moments, take away all those things that distract so that our minds and our hearts be focused upon your word, your good news for this day. Speak, O oh Lord. We, your servants, are listening. Amen. A number of years ago, um, Charles Finney, uh, Kenny, excuse me, Charles Kenny wrote a one-act play entitled The Terrible Meek. There are three characters in this play. Uh, a Roman soldier, his captain, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. The play opens, and it's, uh, it's the scene of the crucifixion. The captain and the soldier are the ones that drive the nails into Jesus. They stand there and watch him die in, in agony. And they finish him off with the thrust of the spear into his side. Later, as the crowds disperse, the two of them begin to wonder about what they have done and, 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 and why. It was so important to, to kill this man. About the best they can do is decide that uh, they did it simply because they were obeying orders, because of their obligation to duty. But they confessed to one another that that, was, that no longer really sufficed. And they were quite troubled when, as evening falls and Mary comes back to the scene where her son died. The captain then begins to address Mary. Listen to his words. We stretched out our hands to possess the earth. Domination, power, glory, merchandise, luxury. These are the things at which we aim. But what we really gain is, is pestilence and famine crude labor and the enslaved hatred of men and women and ghosts that will haunt us forever. We've lost both the earth and ourselves in trying to possess it. Then he says to Mary, I tell you, woman, this dead son of yours, disfigured, shamed, spat upon, he has built a kingdom here today that will never die. The living glory of your son rules it. The earth is his, he made it. He and his brothers have been molding and making it through the long ages. And they're the only ones who will ever really possess it. Not the proud, not the wealthy, not the vaunting empires of this world. Something happened up here on this hill today to shake all of our kingdoms of blood and fear to dust. The meek, the terrible meek, the fierce, agonizing meek, they are the ones who are about to enter into their inheritance. It's a fictional play, but I wanted to share those words with you because in those words we capture what Jesus had to say to us in that third beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I hope you noticed earlier in our service that, that the words of this third beatitude, Jesus literally took them from the Words of the 37th Psalm. It is a, it is a psalm that uh, invites us to trust God, to wait for God, to depend upon God. It's a psalm that, that cautions us not to, not to fret over the success of the wicked, not to envy how they have prospered, to understand that their prosperity has no permanent value that soon there will be a day when all of that will be gone and only the meek shall possess the blessings of God's grace. Now, i got to be honest. 
While that's good news, I, I sort of trip over that word meek because my image of meek is best illustrated in the front of your bulletin. How many of you all looked? If you don't remember what it was, take a good look. Now that lamb is meek. He's weak. He's vulnerable. I either think of, of that kind of image or when I hear the word, I think of someone who lacks courage and conviction. As one person in the earlier service said to me going out the door, someone who's kind of wimpy. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because the word that we translate meek comes from the Greek word praes, which literally means controlled power. It is the power of, of the, the harnessed power of, of water. It is the harnessed power of wind. It is, it is the image of a, of a horse that's been that's been broken so that it's responsive to its rider's lead. It is the harnessed power of a farm animal linked to farm equipment. It has nothing to do with our whether or not we're assertive. But in fact, that word has everything to do with our posture before God. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. The posture of meekness is one that, first of all, um, recognizes our limitations. Think of the sequence of these Beatitudes. We began with, with um, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, the poor in spirit are those who recognize their sin, how far they have missed God's mark. And then you have blessed are those who mourn, and, and that's an image of those who, uh, who have not only recognized their sin, the fact of their sin, but they've made that 16-inch journey from their head to the heart, and they grieve over what their sin has done. They mourn what they have become. And while both of those beatitudes are, are critical to that process of, of beginning a new life, in and of themselves, they do not go far enough. Now, Jesus speaks of meekness. And, and, and with that, Jesus has in mind those who began to realize my limitations. I can't fix what's broken in my life. I can't recreate my life. And it's only those who come to that point who are ultimately enabled, enable and make available themselves to the power of God which can redeem and restore and make life new. The most important three statements you and I can make in this posture is, I can't. God can. And I'm going to finally let him. Meekness is the posture that admits the limit. Meekness is also the posture a posture in which we come to God, approach God with an open mind. If you're an educator, you know you can't teach a student anything who already is convinced that they know all the answers, that they, have, they know how to solve all the problems, that they've figured out what is right and what is wrong. You can't teach them anything because you can't feel a closed mind. Now think about those people who were most adamant, vehement in their opposition to Jesus. First of all, you got the Pharisees. They knew the law. They majored in the minutia of the commandments because they knew that following the law to the utmost degree 
is what makes for a holy life, a life that is pleasing to God. They had it wrapped in a box and tied together with a bow. So you can imagine their horror when, uh, when Jesus violated Sabbath law or when Jesus said, proclaimed that he had come to fulfill the law or when Jesus, said, uh, when Jesus associated with those people considered unclean by the law. They, do, they made up their minds real quick that Jesus couldn't be the one to whom the law pointed because he violated so many statutes. They weren't willing to look and see and ask the question, is God doing something new among us? Then you got the Sadducees. The Sadducees are in charge of the sacrificial system because they're in charge of the temple. They know what brings about forgiveness. It's spelled out in the sacrificial system of Leviticus. They know what you must present in order for God to pronounce forgiveness of your sins. How dare Jesus have the audacity to speak forgiveness to people? How dare Jesus say that uh, he is the fulfillment of that system, the sacrifices, or that, or that all you have to do is believe in him and have everlasting life. That's not right in their mind, in their closed mind. Or think about the zealots. The zealots were the ones who, who knew that Messiah is going to come leading the army of God and they're going to drive out the Romans and they're going to defeat all the enemies of God's people and they're going to establish the mightiest kingdom that's ever been on earth. Can you imagine what they were thinking when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey? That's no conquering hero. That doesn't fit the, 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 the warrior imagery of the day of the Lord motif. Surely this can't be the one for whom we've been waiting and they closed their minds. So did the folk in Nazareth the day that Jesus stood up and, and read the, from, from, the, from the, 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 the prophet Isaiah and declared that Today, this scripture's been fulfilled in your presence. What's he talking about? This is Mary and Joseph's son. He's not the long-awaited one. And they ran him out of town. Now think of all those groups. Every one of them, what they shared in common is they had already made up their minds about what God, would, what God should do and what God would do. And they didn't allow for any other possibility. Contrast that with Peter in the story contained in Acts 10. Peter's going to the home of Simon reluctantly because he's a tanner. And there he has a dream. And in the dream, God shows him every animal of the world and says to him, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter's mortified. What do you mean get up and kill and eat? Lord, there's unclean animals here. I've never eaten that. And again, the word is get up, kill, and eat. The dream ends. But twice in that chapter, we find Peter still thinking about the dream. Fact is, in thinking about the dream, Peter right there is allowing for the possibility that maybe, just maybe, in spite of what I have always believed, in spite of what God had said long ago, maybe, just maybe, God is doing something new among us. And the door for the Gentiles begins to open. I hope you and I never get to the place where, where we feel as though we figured God out. 
and where in our smugness we determine what God will do and, and what God can do. My friends, because I'm convinced that if that's, a, if that's our attitude, if the, door, if the box is closed and the, along with the mind, that sooner or later we're going to find ourselves wandering off. And, and, and quite frankly, we're going to wind up making a mess of things all over again. That's why I hope your prayer, my prayer, not only today but every day is very simple. Lord, today show me. Teach me, guide me, because it's only that open mind, that open heart that can fully experience God's blessing. Will that be yours? This posture of meekness is, is also one that, that is able to absorb adversity without lashing back. I, I want you to think of a story in the life of Joseph, the Old Testament character. Now, you, you probably wouldn't immediately think of meekness and Joseph as being connected because, you know, Joseph was in, anything but meek, and, and he's pretty proud, and particularly when he was wearing that coat of many colors, and he loved to show it off to his brothers, you know that. But I'm thinking about a, another time in Joseph's life, long after that, that coat had been torn up, long after his brothers had beat him up and, and, and thrown him in a pit and sold him into slavery, long after he had been falsely accused in Egypt, long after he had interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams and, and, and writ about famine or about abundance followed by famine, long after he had risen to a place of power. But one day, he's there in Egypt, and, and his brothers have made the trip into Egypt to try to find food. They don't know who he is. They don't recognize him. He was just a kid back so long ago. But Joseph remembers and recognizes them, and it's the perfect moment. Can't you see it? Can't you just see Joseph thinking to himself, oh, I've got you now. This is the moment I've always dreamed of. Can't you just see Joseph lashing out, uh, enacting his vengeance, demanding justice for all that they had done to him and what had happened in his life? And who would have blamed him? But Joseph takes a different posture. Rather than lashing out, it is the posture of grace. Joseph not only provides food for the family, but he goes on to hatch a scheme that's going to bring that entire broken and strange family back together again in the safety and the abundance of Egypt. And don't miss this because of the posture that Joseph took. Reconciliation occurred. Don't we see Jesus doing the same thing? After the scourging, after the beatings, after hanging there on that cross for, for hours, in the midst of all the insults, rather than calling down the armies of God to set him free, Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. And he offers grace while absorbing their adversity. And quite frankly, that's what he expects of all of us. Isn't that what he meant when he said to us, You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, you turn the, left, the other cheek to them. And isn't that what Jesus had in mind when he said, I tell you to, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? And isn't that what Jesus had in mind when he said, if somebody wants your, your tunic, Give them your cloak as well. And if someone forces you to go with them for a mile, you choose to go to Jesus could demand that. Because Jesus knew the truth that's embedded in Psalm 37. 
that our anger and our desire for revenge and our fretting, all it ever does is lead to evil. My friends, when in the face of adversity, you and I can take this posture of grace, we have the power to diffuse the powers of hatred and violence and injustice and evil in any form that it appears. They can overcome us, in the posture of grace, we can overcome them. The meek choose the latter. And, and, and then the final posture of grace is the posture of trust. I mentioned it earlier, but in these 11 verses, twice we're called to trust God. We're called to commit our way to God, to delight in God, to wait for God, to always hope in God. And the promise is, if we do that, we shall be blessed. There's an inheritance of God's richest grace waiting. Well, I wish I could say, yeah, I do that every day. You know, I'm waiting on the Lord. And I'm trusting God with everything. And it's real easy to do so. I wish I could say that. But you know I'd be lying. The truth is, I, I kind of want to keep my hands on the steering wheel. I, I kind of want to be in control. I kind of want to depend upon my abilities and what I know. I, I, I really get uncomfortable in that image of a, a leap of faith into the darkness. I want to believe, and I, I, and I will say God's there. What I've found out is that when it comes my turn to take the step or to let go of the will, it's a whole lot more difficult than when it's your turn. That's why every day I have to start with Without exception, I have to start with simply, Lord, today, teach me to trust you a little bit more. Take my grip, make my grip a little looser on the steering wheel of my soul. John Claypool, um, in one of his books, tells the story of a young woman who felt the call to be a missionary in China. And this is in days long before aircraft uh, tr air transportation and, and so she raised the money and she got on a boat to China and, and she's all excited about going there and serving the Lord in China and helping these people and, and, and uh, then she gets out several days into the, into the voyage and she begins to have second thoughts she begins to wonder what if what, how am I going to support myself or or, or what if I can't really learn the language well enough? Or, or what if they simply don't want to listen and accept me? And, and the more she thought of those things, the more she was determined that when I get to China, the first thing I'm going to do is get on a boat back to California. With all that stressing as the days went by, one night in, a, in her sleep she had a dream. And in this dream she's standing in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And the only thing supporting her is a floating piece of two-by-four. And while she's standing there on this piece of two-by-four in the middle of the ocean, she hears a voice that says, take a step, walk to China. And she says, I can't walk to China. If I step off this thing, I'm going to sink fast. And the voice said, I said, take a step, walk to China. And there's back and forth, back and forth. You know it's her and the Lord having this argument. Finally, she takes a step. And, and, and just as her toe gets ready to touch that water, somewhere from out of the deep there emerged, uh, emerged another two by four. And she's standing on that one. Take a step. Walk to China. She takes another. And somewhere from out of the deep, there comes this two by four, and it supports her. And in her dream, she walks all the way across the ocean to China. And when she walks on the sands, 
There's a whole village ready to welcome her, ready for her to be their teacher. The meek are the ones who are able. Even if the water's deep, the way is uncertain. The ones who are willing take that next step. Trusting that wherever it lands, God's already there. And his grace is sufficient. My friends, all week long I, I've been looking at this beatitude and really fussing with it. But I came to this point. I hope, I want to invite you today to join me as we renew the journey. A journey in which we're willing, more than anything, to admit the limitations. Quit kidding ourselves so that we can depend upon God. A, a journey in which every day we're still asking the question, Lord, what, can you, what new thing can you show me? In what new way will you lead me? A journey in which no matter what happens, we're committed to being vessels of grace and instruments of God's peace. A journey that will lead us to God's blessing. I'm going to make that journey. Because Jesus said, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. How about you? Amen. Our closing hymn is God of grace and God of glory. As we stand to sing, if, if, if there's somebody here today and you've never made a, a true profession of faith in Jesus, or maybe there's somebody here and you just need to get things right. They're not right what they ought to be. Maybe you want to join our church today or just have words of prayer. I'll be here to greet you and to pray with you. As God's Spirit leads, I invite you to come. Let's stand together.
And now may the grace of God, the love that he revealed to us in Christ Jesus, and the inspiring blessing of the Holy Spirit continue to lead all of us in the life that is abundant and eternal. Amen.